Thank you all for uh, making it back this afternoon. We're going to go ahead and um, continue our track this afternoon. Uh, this time we have uh, Chelsea Doyle, uh, Chelsea Doyle uh, who will be talking about uh, managing your tuple graveyard. Chelsea uh, works at an organization called Brex, so let's give her a hand. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for the intro, Stephen. My name is Chelsea Dole, and I'm going to be talking about managing your tuple graveyard. And what precisely that means will become a bit more obvious with time, but I promise we'll get there. If it turns. Uh, I can use my hand. That's fine. <laughs> Working a second ago. Anyway. Oh. Now it works again. Merci. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Chelsea. I work at a fintech company called Brex based in the US. I work there as a software engineer. Currently at Brex, we're originally known as the credit card for startups, but we also do expense management software, et cetera, et cetera. Currently, I work on the data storage team where we manage around 400 Postgres instances or more growing always across our systems. And I work on Postgres infrastructure, query optimization, and a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> turn it off and turn it back on again, or just point it in the right direction also helps. Uh, so today we're going to be talking and working our way towards Postgres bloat, but getting through some topics in our journey there. First, talking about multi-version concurrency control, which you may have learned a bit from Boris about in the last session if you attended. Uh, vacuum, etc. Getting into table bloat, what causes it, what impact can it have, et cetera, and then going into quantifying, mitigating, and avoiding it in the first place. And finally, finishing off with a bit more of a holistic, high-level view. Um, how can you design your data access patterns against that happening in the first place? So without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> can you tell it's my first time using one of these? <laughs> Maybe not. So anyway, multi-version concurrency control. Multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC, is basically just a set of rules that Postgres uses to provide two seemingly disparate or contradictory features that are both very important. The first one is transaction isolation, and the second is fast performance for reading and writing. Transaction isolation is the I in ACID. ACID is our acronym that we use to describe transactions in a general sense across a SQL standard, not just Postgres. So ACID stands for atom atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. So the I is for isolated. Data within a transaction, when it's acidic, basically represents table state at the transaction start time. And our other key element that MVCC is providing is fast performance. So it's kind of easy to provide the first, but getting it along with fast performance is the hard part. Fast performance is typically de defined as writes not blocking reads, or rarely, and reads not blocking writes. These two goals are contradictory because when you use um, this I, this transaction isolation, it can lead to cascading locks and weights, and by extension, potentially bad performance. If you think about the most basic way that you could provide locking, it might be a little bit easier to understand. If you've got a single write lock, for example, you have one session, it updates or writes some data, and it relinquishes the write lock, and then it allows another session to do the same, it is inherently a single-threaded process. The idea of concurrency control really can't be in the mix whatsoever. So MVCC is the process through which we can provide these two kind of contradictory ideas. The approach that MVCC takes for this is row versioning via tuples, focusing on the multi-version part of that acronym. A tuple is you know, a mathematical or general idea for just an ordered set of values, but in Postgres itself, we refer to it as the physical or immutable row stored on a disk. A row itself is similar, but a little bit different. A row is the logical construct consisting of one to maybe more, one to n tuples under the hood. I think of it as a row is what is returned to you when you run select, and a tuple is how that row is stored underneath the hood. So a live tuple 
is the newest row version for some data or an older row version that's still useful in some way. There's some select query or even update query, something that's using that version. So even if it's a bit old, it's actually necessary for something under the hood. Whereas a dead tuple is the opposite, everything not covered under a live tuple's umbrella definition. It is an old row version that is also completely unused by any running queries. All DML queries, such as insert, update, delete, only will ever add new tuples or update metadata on the underlying or kind of hidden columns of existing tuples. MVCC uses something called transaction snapshots to execute this. A snapshot is a per transaction data structure used in memory. It uses these um, columns that are hidden but exist on every single table called xmin, xmax, and xip list. And these three in tandem define what is within and without the, um, the view of that individual transaction for the purpose of the query. xmin is the transaction ID which inserted this tuple. xmax is either zero slash null, meaning it's not deleted or updated. Or if it has been, it's the transaction ID that performed that action. An XIP list, which I'll talk a bit more about in a couple slides, is sort of an array of currently running transactions that are up in the air. It depends. It's important to note that transaction ID, which is only assigned to um, transactions which edit data, is assigned at transaction start, not on commit. So this is really the reason why you need something like XIP list, but that will become more evident in a later slide. I'm going to go through an example to understand this a bit more. So here we have an example table with ID, first name, city, and updated at. We can say maybe it's a locations of employees at a company or something different. We can see in gray we have the two columns I mentioned which exist on every single table but you just usually don't see them. Xmin shows that the same transaction apparently did a batch insert of all these rows at once. And Xmax is empty, so they have not yet been updated or deleted. They're all live. If we were to insert a new row onto our table, it would look like this. We would insert the new tuple there. Uh, it has Xmin of 600, because that's our current transaction ID. And then we have the rest of our data, and that's about it. Seems pretty easy so far. If we then updated this data, so John, the employee, previously lived in New York, and now he's moving to Seattle, this is what this would look like. An update is really just a delete and an insert within a single transaction. So first we delete, we set x max of our previous tuple to be the current transaction ID, and then we insert another tuple after that with identical data, only the columns change that we need updated. We call this, um, this action of updating xmax, or often call it a soft delete. Nothing was removed from disk. Nothing was deleted. We might think of it in a traditional sense. We've marked it as unnecessary. Finally, what does an actual delete look like? A delete is just half of what we did for update. So all we do is this soft delete. All we do is update xmax for our second tuple for John in Seattle so that the current transaction ID, 609, is as xmax. Sounds great. So just only inserting, only editing xmax, or only updating xmax, is that just infin infinitely increasing row count to the end of time? Luckily, no. We do have something called vacuum. Vacuum has a lot of tasks. These refer to mostly what auto vacuum does. There's additional things that auto vacuum configures typically. The main usage of vacuum is to delete dead tuples from Postgres pages, which frees up the space for reuse. Um, but it also does some other important tasks. AutoVacuum will update Postgres internal stats by running Analyze at the same time. This improves the query planner's effectiveness. Um, it also updates the visibility map. The visibility map can be used for future vacuums as well as index-only scans to improve the performance. And finally, it will free up transaction IDs for reuse to avoid transaction ID exhaustion. If we go back to our example and think about what would happen if we vacuumed, it would look like this. Vacuum does the hard delete. So it actually deletes all the data from the existing tuples, freeing up that page space for reuse. So if we were to do future inserts, they would go into the spaces that have now been deleted from. We can take a look at that here. 
if we were to do an insert and a select right after each other, we might see an example of using reusing that space, as well as something I mentioned before, XIP list. If first on transaction ID 611, we insert into the table values XYZ something, in this case, Olivia, who's going to be living in New York, then we can see we're reusing that space on disk. However, let's say that for whatever reason, this is going to be a really long transaction. We're doing a big batch, probably ill-advised, and it's going to take around 10 minutes to run this insert. During the time of this insert, we're going to execute another select. So this is concurrent access if we run select star. Because, the tr because our um, select snapshot, like I said before, a transaction snapshot, this kind of in-memory data store of what you see and don't see, will have XIP lists, we can see that there is a currently running transaction in a different session for transaction ID 611. So it says, OK, in general, you're going to be able to see everything over this transaction ID, but anything that's still running is sort of an oddity. It sort of says, go back and check, please. In this case, it goes back and checks and says, OK, actually, it still hasn't committed by the time our select is done, so you will not be seeing this row. I've been pretty careful so far, at least I hope, to use the phrase freeing up space for reuse, not deleting with vacuum, because it's important to note that without explicit intervention, Postgres disk usage will only ever increase. So pages are created, but not actually deleted. Tuples are deleted, not pages. A page is the smallest unit of disk space, 8 kilobytes in default, which stores primarily heap tuples, but also page header data and line pointers. You can see this kind of you can see this um, example here. This space here might be used for heap tuples. At the top, you have page header data, and then you have these line pointers, which allow queries to access the page itself, look at the header data, and then have a direct, roughly O of one access to figuring out where in that page you should be looking for an individual tuple when you need to seek it. There are exceptions to the idea of um, vacuum never, never deleting page data, but they're quite, quite rare. I would say never something that you should design around. Page, pages can be truncated in certain circumstances only if they're the very, very end of the entire heap. But this is not the focus of the talk, so I'm going to skip over that as it's more specialized. So now we've gotten through MVCC just a bit. Might be a refresher um, since a number of you guys were at Boris' talk shortly before, similar topic. Uh, now we can actually get into table bloat, which is the focus of this talk. Table bloat, to borrow a phrase used in PG Analyze, which is a definition I liked quite a bit, is less than optimal page density. This means the number of live tuples on a page versus the number that could hypothetically fit on a page is not optimal. If you were to visualize this, it might look something like this. At the top, we can say that we have high tuple density in these pages. We have three pages with 10 total tuples spread across them, some empty spots, but not too many, versus the same amount of data stored across seven pages on the bottom. We can see that we have 10 tuples still, but it's across, um, it's across seven pages this time. The effects of this can be quite far-reaching. We would say table bloat is often problematic because with dead tuples occupying what should be space that the Postgres system can assign to new tuples being inserted, it will just continue to create new pages, new pages, new pages. This will unnecessarily increase disk usage. However, also, after, even after vacuum runs and the tuples are deleted, those live tuples are now just stored very sparsely. So this leads to increased I.O. during scans, which I would say is actually often the worst part of it. Um, I think that it's, if you think of it like this, the increased I.O., if you were to run a select star to receive these three pages or these 10 tuples, you would have to scan against three pages versus down here, the same select would need to run against seven pages. Therefore, more I.O. However, I said often problematic. And the reason for this is that bloat is usually the root cause of other issues which might affect the end user, whether that be a DBA running queries or perhaps more importantly, um, an application using this actual Postgres table. That's really the problem we're trying to solve. 
And so the end result of something like table bloat can be bad read latency from that increased I.O. It can be higher expensive disk usage. If you're using a lot of disk, that might be very expensive for you unnecessarily. And like I said, high IOPS, again, potentially expensive, especially if you're using something like Aurora, which may be charging based on your IOPS, not just your CPU, or not just uh, a set level. So again, bloat is really the root of other potential issues, maybe not an issue in itself. Bloat occurs through a mix of two factors always together. So just one, often not a problem, but together can lead to bloat. First, update and delete heavy workloads. As I said, um, bloat is caused by this oversaturation of dead tuples. So what are dead tuples created by? Updates and deletes. For example, patterns that might lead to something like this could be user activity resulting in cascading updates and deletes. User does one thing, updates 2,000 things. Multiply that by maybe millions of users, that could be problematic. You can also have scheduled batch jobs, which delete or edit massive amounts of data at once. That can be an anti-pattern that could lead you to table bloat. And secondly, in tandem with that, badly tuned auto vacuum configuration. Overly conservative or older default auto vacuum configs paired up with this update and delete pattern can mean auto vacuum can't catch up. It can be running all the time, potentially too slowly, depending on your configurations or kind of, you know, reduced in effectiveness. And it means that it's not able to clean up as many as it should, and it's also maybe not getting the resources allocated to it in order to run more effectively. An example case study that I've seen in multiple organizations of a situation that might lead to table bloat might look like this. Imagine you have a machine learning feature store. You're going to have a table that has a feature name, uh, user ID, and then a value for the feature. You can imagine that you have a unique constraint across feature name and user ID. For example, last login for user 61466 should only ever have one value. So the first time, you're going to insert this value. But if it's ever updated, you're going to do an upsert. You're going to do insert or on conflict, update it to the new value. And you may be going to have hundreds or even thousands of features per user. The table size, let's say it's maybe 300 gigs or so, could be bigger. And all the writes, like I said, are going to be those upserts. And you have burst-based high-volume write traffic triggered by user activity. So for example, last login, or even more severely, last clicked. That's something you can imagine being updated in a burst, and then not again for a number of hours. And then, you know, very helpfully, you decide, OK, well, when features are deprecated, then let's have a delete job where we delete, I don't know, maybe I don't know, like 10% or 5% of all the rows on the whole table because we're going to deprecate some model and we don't want to have all this disk space laying around. And then, of course, default auto vacuum configurations. The things that are problematic in tandem here are the upsert pattern, the high volume write traffic, the feature deprecation, which is the idea of some batch delete, and the default configuration. You can have this table. It's not, an it's not an inherently bad design in itself, but it's something you need to plan ahead for in order to avoid this. Now that we've understood a bit more about the high level of bloat, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into how to quantify it, mitigate it, and hopefully avoid it. In order to quantify how much table bloat you might have in a system or it's just one table, there's kind of two frames of how you can go about it. The first is that you can use pgstat tuple. This is a Postgres contrib module, which is created specifically for quantifying table bloat and quantifying things in the general design or area of table bloat. This will return a precise value for how much bloat you have as a percentage, along with other values. But it can be very slow running. It uses very high resource usage, so it will very definitely spike your CPU. And the reason for that is it needs to do a full table scan. And it needs to look at the actual table itself. So it's never going to be using an index, because the point is actually to look at the pages. So it can't do that. If you were to run that, you would install the extension as a contrib module, and then you would just select star from pgstat tuple of that table, and you would see the return value, which I'll show an example of shortly. The other sort of school of thought you can use for this is estimation. So there's a bunch of open source estimation queries, usually a couple hundred lines long of some crazy code. 
uh, which leverage internal tables, such as PG class rel tuples. Generally, when you do this, you want to run analyze first, because again, that will help kind of update your internal statistics about estimations of how many tuples you might have using a sample of your table data, et cetera. But this is really good sometimes, because unlike the former, uh, it runs an O of 1. So it doesn't matter if your table is 2 terabytes or 500 megabytes. It's going to run in about the same amount of time, because you're using this kind of stashed uh, estimation of how many, how many rows you may have. The trade-off, of course, is that the first is going to be accurate, and the second is going to be an estimation. So if you are in a place where you're not able to commit the CPU or resources to running something that'll give you more accurate value, that might be a better choice. But if you are, I would say using pgstat tuple is better practice if you're able to do that. If you were to run pgstat tuple, this would be the result you would get. I've cut off a couple lines, but this is, I've marked the areas I think are more critical to look at in yellow. The first thing you would get back is table length in bytes. The second is the total number of live tuples. This third one in yellow is the percentage of those tu of total tuples, which are live, as so in this case, 90%, and the percentage of total tuples, which are dead, 2%, or 2.46. You'll notice this doesn't equal 100%. Of course, because you have live, live tuples, dead tuples, and then free space. Um, you would also see, potentially, that's still not adding up to 100%. That's expected. I would say 95 plus might be ex expected, even on pgstat tuple. Something like fill factor would also come into play here. If you were configuring it to leave extra space in your pages preemptively, that would also change your results here. The key element you're going to look for is going to be this last one, dead tuple percent. In this case, we can say we have 2.46 percentage of total tuples which are dead. If, on the other hand, we ran some really long query we found from some random guy on GitHub, then first we would run analyze verbose, or then we would read over that query and make sure it's actually something we feel safe running instead of just running it to ad hoc. And then once we feel confident in it, you can run the query and receive something probably like this. I've linked one that is probably the most popular that I know of at the bottom if you're interested. First, you might receive the estimated table length in bytes, then the size of the bloat, also in bytes, and finally, the percentage of the real size, this first one, used by bloat. So this is basically your, dead, your bloat percentage to compare to the last one. However, if you may have noticed, these two methods aren't super comparable to each other. They're both estimating or giving you an idea of table bloat, but they're measuring different things. PGSTAT tuple is looking at a percentage of the count of tuples, which are dead, again, it's real numbers, versus estimation queries are typically looking at the percentage of page space, which is dead. These are two extremely different metrics. And so for that reason, I would say that especially if you're using estimation, it's the most helpful to use it in relative terms against other tables, rather than comparing it to anything with pgstat tuple. Tuple size can vary wildly. And also, page level opportunistic pruning can leave four byte tombstones, meaning that one kilobyte of dead page space may be 250 four byte tombstones or it could just be 10 100 byte tuples. And it's really hard to compare an estimation. So I would say that if you're using estimation queries, I found it most helpful to run it on a couple different tables, including one that I know is probably gonna be fine. Maybe it's an insert only workload, or maybe it's something that has very low deletes or updates, like a basic profile, and then compare it to something that I think might be more problematic, like the machine learning table example I gave earlier. If you want to learn more about the opportunistic pruning, I recommend this other talk by Peter Gagan called Bloat and Postgres a Taxonomy, which he gave most recently at Scale in California, but I believe a couple years ago as well. There's some more information about that. So now let's say we've run these queries, we've done our due diligence, we have some numbers, but kind of the key question, how much is too much? What do I have to fix versus what's just expected? Annoyingly, uh, it does depend, which is the kind of catch-all 
like Brant's gotcha moment. Um, however, I'm going to do the extremely um, dangerous act of having opinions and sharing my personal rules of thumb about what I think in this scenario. In my personal opinion, speaking for myself, a very small table, which I would say is under a gigabyte, it kind of just doesn't matter. It's not going to affect you. Up to 70% bloat is fine. Honestly, I would say even that is a little conservative. It doesn't matter a whole lot. Again, it's about the end result. What is the result of bloat, not a, what is bloat doing itself? A small to medium table, which I would say is 1 to 30 gigs, up to 25% dead tuples is probably acceptable. A larger table, so 30 to 100 gigabytes, up to 20% is acceptable. And very large table, which is going to be 100 gigs plus, 18% um, is acceptable. These will all change depending on your situation, but the overall rule is that the bigger the table gets, the lower the percentage of dead tuples I would personally aim to have. The reason for this being that, well, imagine if your tuple, imagine if your table is 100 gigabytes, 18 or, you know, if we were aiming for 25%, like a one gigabyte table, that's going to be 25 gigabytes of dead tuple space. Not even free space, but dead tuple space. And with that, you would have to be paying for, first of all, a lot of the extra disk space. And that's going to be a lot of extra disk that you're scanning over unnecessarily. Dealing with bloated tables, there's kind of two tracks that you'll need to pursue. The first is configuring auto vacuum to be more aggressive or use more resources. And the second is repacking or rebuilding existing tables. When you configure auto vacuum more aggressively, there's two basic things that you do. The first thing you do is change the schedule, and the second thing you do is potentially change the resources it has to play with. In order to change the schedule of auto vacuum, there's two configurations you'd primarily use. The first would be auto vacuum vacuum scale factor. So the default of this is going to be 0 0.2, aka 20%. And what this means is at least 20% of the table must have been at, deleted or updated in order for vacuum to be triggered again automatically. So the smaller you make this configuration, the more frequently it will be triggered. If, for example, you were to change it to 0 0.01, that means that just 1% of table size will need to be edited or deleted in order for vacuum to be triggered again. Um, a common suggestion I see for this online by other people is 0 0.01, which seems like a big change from 20%. I'd recommend configuring it based on your own discretion and thinking about the goals of what level of table bullet are you actually aiming for here. Secondarily, auto vacuum vacuum threshold. This acts in tandem with the first one to define when auto vacuum is actually going to be triggered. The default is 50, um, but overall, I basically wouldn't change this unless you were using it for this hack, basically, in case instead of you want, instead of wanting it to be triggered with a ratio of dead to live tuples, if you want to say, eh, I don't really care, just trigger it when it hits 200,000 by a raw number. Usually, you would only do this if you've got a very large table. There's no point really to doing it with a small table. In fact, I would say it's not a good idea. But if you do want to change that, what you would do is you would set scale factor to 0, and then you would set vacuum threshold to the number of tuples that you want to be dead before you trigger a vacuum. And it's very important to note that with both of these, you typically want to tune with altered table not on a per database level. Often, you could change your configurations in a postgresql.conf that applies to the whole database or something, or the whole um, cluster. But in this case, these are table specific. If, for example, you have 10 tables on your database, one of them is massive, it has tons of writes and updates and deletes, and the others are pretty small, which is common from my experience. It's not great to tune these to they apply to all databases, to all your tables. You want it to only apply to the ones that need this configuration change. The second part of auto vacuum configuration, like I said, is changing the resources that auto vacuum has. So now we've decided, OK, here's the cadence it's going to run, but how many resources are you allowing it to have? Auto vacuum vacuum cost delay is something that can be used to configure a cost delay or wait time on auto vacuum. The purpose of it is to make sure auto vacuum doesn't eat up too much of your CPU. It's a pretty old setting, and since PG11, it's two milliseconds, but on earlier versions of Postgres, it's 20, which is much higher. So even on any version of Postgres, 
I would basically suggest changing this to the more recent uh, to the more recent default of two milliseconds. The reason for this is that using modern hardware, two milliseconds is good. It doesn't really depend on the software. It's about the hardware. It's saying um, that it's going to. It's assuming that your hardware and your disks are on spinning disks and that they're older. So, for example, if you're running 9.6, but you are on like, an average disk. You can still change this to new milliseconds, and you'll see your vacuums run a lot faster. Um, and that's something I would suggest. You also have auto vacuum max workers. If you need to give your if you need to give your database as a whole more workers or more threads that it can be using to run auto vacuum, the default is three server wide. Typically, this is actually fine, and also, typically, if you have many tables, thousands plus, it's something that you want to do. It applies to your whole server, because it's actually the number of workers across the server. So in order to see if you should change this, you can check pgstat progress vacuum. And here, you can see the number of current vacuums going on across your entire server at any given point in time. If you always see it maxed out at three, you can keep an eye on it over you know, a period of time, and maybe increase it by one see how it reacts, et cetera. When you increase it, you want to be looking at not only does it, is it still maxing out at four, but what is the effect of reallocating that worker to extra vacuum? Because now you're going to be having more vacuums running at once. And of course, that worker was previously doing something else, probably working on queries. So it's good to see the holistic view of what effect is this having on my database. You can also repack or rebuild tables. The in-the-box way to do it is with vacuum full. However, um, I would overall not recommend this due to the extremely heavy lock that it takes. Vacuum full completely rewrites the table and all indexes into a new disk file with no extra space. This takes an access exclusive lock, which means that it blocks reads and writes coming in. The wasted space that you had with your dead tuples is totally returned, which is great, but it comes at a very heavy cost. With that in mind, I would generally recommend using extensions such as PG Repack or PG Squeeze to do a similar thing. These sort of extensions will duplicate the schema of the bloated table, copy over all incoming data via triggers, and basically alter the table names to switch them under the hood before dropping the old bloated table. This will take an access share lock, which means that you can't um, do DDL actions during it, but you can still update, read, delete, all the normal things. It will require a 2x the table space in disk, as well as very significant CPU and RAM during. So if you run this, you would expect to see very spiked CPU during the process, because it's using really heavy triggers. You're basically doubling the amount of writes that you're doing across that table, as well as writing a completely new table with backfield data. I've personally found, again, speaking for PG Repack, I haven't personally used PG Squeeze, but I've found PG Repack to be occasionally flaky in my experience, which isn't great. I will admit that one of the flaky times is when somebody just canceled the PID <laughs> from under me, so I don't know if that's broadly applicable. But I would say that um, I would say that it's something that you shouldn't expect to work 1,000% of the time with no issues. That said, um, the worst case scenario in my experience from PG Repack is something that I think is manageable and worth the cost of it occasionally failing one in a hundred or something times. The failure scenario, if you were to cancel that PID, is that incomplete tables from the PG Repack schema would exist and need to be manually dropped. So if we were to fail, there's not going to be data corruption in your old tables. It's just that it's going to be halfway through, filling up these new ones, never cut over. And unless you go in there and manually drop them, it's never going to be cleaned up. So you just have to know that that's your job to go in and do that. No data loss or downtime for that. Overall, I would definitely recommend that for use. PG Repack, compared to alternatives such as PG Squeeze, is also worth knowing a little bit about. With Repack, it's an extension. Um, so you would create extension PG Repack, and then you call it from an external client like this using the host, user, database, et cetera. You can call the entire database or table, but generally you want to do it on a per table basis, because like I said, you're already going to be spiking CPU quite a lot. So it's best to be more controlled or conservative about it overall. 
PG squeeze is a little bit different. So it operates completely within the binary, meaning that you create extension, and then you actually just call a SQL command. Comparing these, I would say that PG repack is less invasive. It keeps the Postgres binary as is, and it's supported by external or managed Postgres services like RDS because it doesn't need to edit Postgres itself in order to provide this service. Um, on the other hand, PG squeeze, you could say, is more feature complete. It allows you to do things like scheduling repacks, and it's also just kind of convenient because you just get to call a query, which you can schedule from a cron job or something like that if you want to. But it comes at a cost because it runs and edits the binary itself. So you are not able to use it in anything that's going to be a managed service, which is a major downside for a lot of people. And I would say, overall, it's more invasive. It chooses to give you more by changing Postgres itself more. Now that we've understood that, I'm going to get a little bit into designing bloat-aware database access patterns. Because again, the goal here isn't always to be running along and then kick a rock and then say, oh, dang, now I have to put on a Band-Aid. It's to actually go around the rock in the first place and avoid table bloat. When you talk about creating tables, it's important to communicate with yourself and your team things such as how, when, and for what purpose are you going to be writing and reading your data. So what percentage of your transactions are going to be reads, writes, et cetera? Something like this can give you a really good idea of what sort of um, bloat you may have down the line. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm creating this table, uh, I expect there to be uh, about this many writes or updates, and then, you know, and this many reads. You might have a much better idea of what sort of services or repacking or auto vacuum configuration you might want to set up from the get go instead of just when it becomes a problem. It's also important to know roughly what percentage of data growth you expect to happen annually, quarterly, however much it happens. Um, this can sometimes be a surprise to people. It's oftentimes, and I, I, don't say this as a, I don't say this to target anybody in particular from anybody I've worked with, but people don't even know how much data there's going to be because you don't know how many users there's going to be sometimes. You don't know, you know what sort of new features there will be. So it's sometimes hard to say exactly how much you'll have in a year to come. But even a rough estimation can be really helpful because, again, the difference between having tons of updates on a you know, 20 gigabyte table and a 2 terabyte table is really big. I recently had a scenario where we created a table, and I said, OK, you know, high five, let's go. See you guys in a bit. And they came back, and they said, hey, I think we need to partition. And I said, really? Why need to partition? They said, well, it's been four months, and we have two terabytes of data. <laughs> and I said, oh, <laughs> that's, that's a little bit unexpected. <laughs> so that was a time when I could have done that better, and I could have communicated with the team better. What sort of access you will or won't support is also important to know. If you're a DBA, or if you're a database team, and you want to give other teams the access to dis you want to give other teams the ownership of what's within the data and you have ownership of the infrastructure and the systems themselves then it's important for those teams to know exactly what they're allowing is it are there going to be single sources of rights are you going only going to allow rights from this database from one service or are there rights from many many different sinks coming in are they able to actually control, or do they have code review access to when somebody might be changing data, or could another team do that without them realizing? In general, it's really great if you can design it so that there's only a single source writing to your database if possible, and that can help a lot with managing this sort of access. If your, up, if your app is very update and delete heavy, then you might look at redesigning your data access patterns so you can have fewer updates and deletes. Often people think about, OK, I'm having bloat. Now I need to repack and configure, and that's the first thing you do. But actually, step one is to step back and say, do I actually need to be updating and deleting this much? Because the best way to get ahead of it is actually to see if you can reduce that from the app side. If the app can you know, change some code, often just a couple lines, and suddenly send 30% fewer updates and deletes, that's a lot less work than jumping into all this deep database stuff, and it becomes a lot more maintainable down the line. For example, if user actions are triggering a burst of updates, as I mentioned, sometimes on a single row, can you update each row just once instead of n times? That can make a big difference. 
Or if you're updating just the same row, let's say last seen or last clicked five, 100 times a second, can you have an append-only log table instead? That way you're just inserting. You're not updating or deleting. In adding a query, so instead of just selecting the one row, it's filtering and ordering by the most recent. Of course, this creates a different problem, which we'll get to on the next page, but it's worth continuing and considering as well. If you have regular large delete jobs or update jobs, then you might check if your data set is compatible with partitioning, meaning you can replace delete with something like detach partition with PG Partman. You can use range or hash partitioning, oftentimes others as well, but I find those to be the most helpful. Um, if you're making sure to always use reasonable batch sizes, that's also very helpful in these scenarios. If you are partitioning, then you want to make sure that your team knows to always use the partition key. That's something you need to communicate. And again, with the first slide of this section, that's kind of a, a, a trade-off. They're, they're taking up this feature of partitioning for the trade-off of always providing the partition key in their queries if they want to be performant. Additionally, Instead of one large weekly delete job, you can consider running seven small daily jobs instead. This is good, first of all, because you just have a reduced transaction size, maybe, um, though you want to be using batch sizes already. I know you already are. Um, but also, this is great because you can potentially configure auto vacuum so it's sensitive enough to run on that semi-daily cadence after each of those seven, having overall a reduced impact on your system. Finally, always a great question for yourself. Are you reinventing any wheels? My personal rule of thumb is that using, for things, using Postgres for things outside of its roughly standard OLTP purpose is fine, often great, especially if you make liberal use of really great community-supported extensions. However, I would say this is true up to a certain scale where you might want to consider other data stores. Other examples of this might be full-text search. So 25 gigs of data in Postgres is going to be great. But if you're up to 100 gigs of data, you might want to start considering Elasticsearch. Similarly, a key value store. If you've got 50 gigs of data with a key value table and there's 80% traffic of, your, of reads, that's totally appropriate for Postgres. But if you're at 120 gigs of data in a table and 80% of your traffic is writes, updates, deletes, that might be a point where you want to consider something like Redis or Memcached or something similar. OK, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you guys so much. I really hope that was helpful. All right, we have a few minutes here for questions. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to go back to the auto vacuum vacuum threshold and auto vacuum vacuum scale factor. Mm -hmm. what is, in, instead of learning to um, Instead of a DBA deciding when to switch to, to a scale factor of zero and use the threshold, what is your opinion about possibly having some kind of exponential setting? So as, as the table gets larger, the, um, the scale factor gets smaller. So as the table gets larger, the scale factor gets smaller. Um, so the purpose of the scale factor getting smaller is because like in the previous slide here, when you get very large, you want the percentage of dead tuples to be lower because the impact of those tuples or the amount of space that percentage means is just much higher in disk. So I would say that when you have 0 0.01, you're never going to actually reach 1% dead tuples. When you set this, it's not saying this is what the dead tuple percentage will be. Um, it's just triggering the vacuum at that time or trying to trigger the vacuum at that time. And if you have a high, if you have a high update delete um, pattern, this will probably trigger pretty often. But overall, more frequent smaller vacuums are going to be better than large infrequent vacuums. It's sort of like I saw this talk where it said vac auto vacuum is a lot like exercise. You know, if it hurts really, really badly, you probably need to be doing it a little more often. <laughs> which is like, it's better to be doing a little something more often than it is you know, climbing Everest once a year. Um, I'm not sure that was very helpful, but overall I would say with the aim of 1% doesn't mean that you're over committing, even though the goal maybe is 18%, which is a lot higher. Is that helpful? Yes, it is, but I was talking about when uh, in the previous slide, 
at, at the bottom where, when you actually set the scale factor to zero and mm. only rely on threshold because a percentage is not enough. And, and so yeah. if there were some kind of exponential setting so that the larger the table gets, the, the, the more often it, it, it auto vacuums it instead of relying on a percentage, if that would be a good idea. Are you saying there is an exponential setting? No, I, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if, uh, in your opinion, there should be. Oh, um, hmm. I think that because it's on a per table basis, it's probably okay without. I think it's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought of that before. If it were on a, if you needed to set this on a per database level, that would be good because it would be very hard to apply the same rules to different tables. Because it's per table, I think it's probably fine as is. On the lower one, if you're using the hack where you sort of set it to a hard number, usually where I see this is where people have very specific and expected patterns. Like again, the example I gave a lot of times of like a big cron job where you're doing a bunch of edits. If you know you're always going to be editing roughly X percentage on a regular cadence, that's a time where I see people set something like this. Um, I think exponential is an interesting idea. I don't think it's necessarily critical given that you're able to tune it differently on different tables though. That's very true. On the other hand, do you have how many examples? Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use the mic? How many examples do you have of databases that has a large number of tables in the, in the order of 100 gigabytes? A large number of tables in order of one gigabyte? Yeah. Uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is from a management standpoint. Hmm. Uh, yes, configuring it uh, properly is a good thing. But the second thing is you probably should observe what the table is doing if it's that critical and that big. So, and that is, that gives you ample opportunity to do, to adjust your configuration if you need to, right? Because you can monitor that, that, that tuple space. Yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, I think that's about time um, for us, but uh, thank you again very much to, uh, to Chelsea for this talk. Thank you.